The first reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through chapter 2, verse 10. And if you would like to follow along, it's on page 49 in your Pew Bible. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them or they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities. Python and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shephra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birthing stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered, with, plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew woman to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses, because, she said, I drew him out of the water. The second reading is from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 8, and this can be found on page 161 in your pew Bibles. <clears throat> I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, <clears throat> excuse me, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, 
but to think with sober judgment, <clears throat> each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. The word of the Lord. Two summers ago, on a trip out west, our family drove through the state of Nebraska. Why Nebraska, you may wonder. I was wondering that myself as we were driving through the state. We had never been to Nebraska, and it was sort of on our way home from Yellowstone. As a way to get to know the state, we got off the main highway and drove on smaller roads to see what we could see. When we saw a sign for Pioneer Village in Minden, Nebraska, we got out and walked around what turned out to be an old reconstructed village from Pioneer Days. And then on our way from Minden to the geographical center of the United States, which is actually in Kansas, we passed through Red Cloud, Nebraska. Red Cloud is an intersection with a main street. Red Cloud is also the birthplace of author Willa Cather. There's a plaque posted out front of Cather's home on Main Street, so we got out of the car and read about the American author. And after that trip, I read two novels from her Prairie trilogy, O Pioneers and My Antonia. Some of you know those? Yeah. Those were written between 1913 and 1918. Well, this past week, I just finished the third novel in that Prairie trilogy, The Song of the Lark. The Song of the Lark is about Thea Kromborg, the fourth of seven children born to Pastor and Mrs. Kromborg, the only Kromborg child with an indomitable spirit and a God-given gift for music. The Kromborgs live in the fictional town of Moonstone, Colorado, where Thea takes piano lessons from Professor Wunsch, the itinerant German who was once an accomplished musician. Thea loves to visit the folks who live on the far side of town, in Mexican town, so that she can listen to Spanish Johnny play the mandolin. Her family is scandalized by her free spirit that sends her to the edges of town to seek out beautiful music and befriend lively while seemingly unsavory characters. Taya gets an opportunity to leave her sheltered life in Moonstone to study music in the big city, in Chicago, where her musical gift will be cultivated and subsequently blossom. It turns out that not piano, but voice is her true gift. The Song of the Lark is a beautiful, gently recounted, unfolding discovery of one's God-given gift and the associated struggle, power, and deep satisfaction that takes over when that God-given gift is allowed to take flight, is made real, is used to its fullest. The reader experiences the delight and imaginative power that takes hold when Taya does what she was created to do. It rekindles generous emotions in the reader. That's how the author puts it in the book's epilogue. It rekindles generous emotions. Our passage from Romans talks about God-given gifts and the necessity of using those gifts in order to live the lives we were created to live and in order to create the community we were created to build and nurture. In Romans, Paul teaches that 
we use our God-given gift, not for our own purpose, but for the purpose of building up the community. We can't realize our God-given gift without the community. And so today we move into the final section of our Summer Romans study, which is the section which focuses most comprehensively on the way in which we are to live our lives, or more loftily called the exhortation to holy living. Listen to the message. This is pastor and author Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of Romans 12, 1 through 8 that Sally just read to us. Sometimes it's helpful to hear scripture in everyday language. It puts God's familiar words into slang. Listen all the while keeping in mind that exhortation to holy living. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for God. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what God wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. I'm speaking to you out of deep gratitude for all that God has given to me, and especially as I have responsibilities in relation to you. Living then as every one of you does in pure grace, it's important that you not misinterpret yourselves as people who are bringing this goodness to God. No, God brings it to you. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what God does for us, not by what we are and what we do for God. In this way, we are like various parts of the human body. Each part gets its meaning from the body as a whole, not the other way around. The body we're talking about is Christ's body, Christ's body of chosen people. Each of us finds our meaning and function as a part of Christ's body. But as a chopped off finger or cut off toe, we wouldn't amount to much, would we? So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, Let's just go ahead and be what we are made to be, without enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. If you preach, preach God's message, nothing else. If you help, just help, don't take over. If you teach, stick to your teaching. If you give encouraging guidance, be careful you don't get bossy. If you're put in charge, don't manipulate. If you're called to give aid to people in distress, keep your eyes open. Be quick to respond. If you work with the disadvantaged, don't let yourself get irritated with them or depressed by them. Keep a smile on your face. That's how Eugene Peterson translates Romans 12, 1 through 8. I find that a fresh way to hear the passage. Sometimes we hear exhortations from scripture and they're so familiar that they wash over us without meaning. The 20th century contemplative Thomas Merton in his book, The Springs of Compl Contemplation wrote, people don't want to hear any more words. In our mechanical age, all words have become alike. To say God is love is like eat Wheaties. <laughs> If what Merton observes is true, then it makes sense for Christians to live out and proclaim with our lives, with our actions, the call to be transformed 
becoming living sacrifices. Perhaps for some of us, Paul's language at the beginning of Romans 12 has become so familiar that we hear it as Merton says, as bland cereal. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, who is your spiritual worship. What does this mean? I wonder if it has something to do with each of us bringing to God all of our dignity, all of our excellence, all of our splendor, all of our everydayness, all of our life, and living fully and faithfully in harmonious relationship with ourselves, with our neighbor, and with God. I know it has something to do with discerning that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. I also know it has something to do with discovering the God-given gift you and I were meant to use for God's glory in community. How does that work when we see all of the horrible things happening in our world? How does that work when we see our neighbors saluting a Nazi flag, as were some in Northern Virginia this past week? How does that work when those whom we call our neighbors send the Jewish mayor of Charlottesville anti-Semitic tweets and slurs on his Twitter feed, as happened this past week? Or when a local clergy member steps aside from his post because of his previous KKK membership? which it turns out he never apologized for, nor paid the fine he was charged for his criminal activity. It doesn't work. And these acts of hatred are to be condemned unequivocally. This is not the kind of behavior or holy living or action that Paul writes about for the Christian community. These actions are not good, not acceptable, nor perfect in any sense. The Baker Bible Commentary lays it out. He lays out, Baker Bible Commentary lays out why that is. Worshiping the living and holy God in a life committed to holy living entails distance from the values of an unholy world where humankind is spiritually dead as a result of sin. The worship of Christians who live out the logic of the gospel in everyday living involves resistance to the values and thought patterns of the secular world. This past week we showed the movie Hidden Figures here at church, which is the story of three African American mathematicians who worked at NASA during the race to space. The story primarily revolves around Katherine Johnson, who from at a very young age, had a gift for numbers. Her parents were insistent that her God-given gift be cultivated and allowed to flourish. So her father drove 120 miles to his job so that his daughter could get the education she needed at a school for African Americans. Catherine graduated from college by age 18. When she went to work for NASA, she and her co-workers lived with the indignities of the segregated South in Hampton, Virginia in 1961. Johnson's spirit was undaunted, and she did not conform to the values around her. She used her God-given gift to do what was good and acceptable and perfect. Over the course of her three decades at NASA, Katherine Johnson's biography includes an impressive list of accomplishments. She calculated trajectories for Alan Shepard's space flight, America's first human in space. She verified the calculations for John Glenn's first American orbit of Earth, which is highlighted in the movie. She computed the trajectory of Apollo 11's flight to the moon, and she worked on the plan that saved Apollo 13's crew and brought them back safely to Earth. The story of Katherine Johnson's life, as told in the movie Hidden Figures, is a beautiful gently paced, unfolding discovery of one's God-given gift. And the associated struggle, power, 
and deep satisfaction that takes over when that gift takes flight and is made manifest. The viewer experiences the delight and imaginative power that takes hold when Catherine dis does what it is she was created to do. After viewing the movie, Willa Cather's observation in her epilogue from The Song of the Lark holds, it rekindles generous emotions in the viewer. Paul urges those in the church in Rome to be transformed by the renewing of their minds. This transformative power of a renewed mind is a mind freed from the old restraining conformities of our past. The transformative power of a renewed mind opens us up to the presence of God's gifts already at hand in our lives. It's the ability to rise above the behaviors and attitudes that are forced upon us by the demands of the world. Katherine Johnson knew that. Taya Kromborg knew that. Recall the Hebrew midwives in the Exodus reading that Sally read. Shifra and Pua went against the edict of the day because they knew what was good and acceptable and perfect. In our Wednesday Bible study this past week, as we were seeking to reconcile Exodus and Romans, someone said, it seems like the Hebrew midwives were using their minds when they told the king of Egypt why they allowed the boys to live, quickly devising that story about the Hebrew women not being like the Egyptian women. As a result of the midwives' unwillingness to conform to the edicts of the king, the deliverer of God's people, Moses himself, was allowed to live and discover his God-given gifts. Just thinking about that reality rekindles generous emotions, doesn't it? Recall the first two verses from the message. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. This does not come easy. We need the community to help us know and understand how to do this. We need this community to help us discover our God-given gifts so that we can then in turn know what is good, acceptable, and perfect. Taya Kromborg discovered a voice like none other that could transport listeners to another time and place. Katherine Johnson discovered the mathematical formulas that could transport humans to the moon, also another time and place. The Hebrew midwives allowed the savior of the chosen people of God to be born, who in turn delivered the Hebrews out of slavery into their own land, a new time for Israel, to a new place. You and I will discover our God-given gift with this community's help. In that discovery, we will rekindle generous emotions, those that just may transport us and others to another time and place. I just hope it's not Nebraska. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm confident, however, that we will find ourselves in that place, if we're not there already, where you and I will use our God-given gift so that we will discern what is good, acceptable, and perfect. May it be so. Thanks be to God. Amen.